Um, um, how should I start this? Right, so Anna asked me to prepare a few slides to sort of uh, describe a little bit my journey into um, science and into academia. So let me just tell you a little bit about myself. Let me just share, share this um, slides with you. Um, right, I'm not gonna have to click off the 28 slides, but I'm using a presentation that I prepared for something different. Um, this stuff that shows you a little bit about what I do anyway. So I am at, I was actually born and raised in France, um, but my family is from Southeast Asia, from Laos. So I've, uh, I studied um, all the way to my master's. I did my undergrad in Montpellier in the south of France and my master's in Marseille at the Institute of Immunology. After my master's, I was sort of, uh, um, honestly, I couldn't, I couldn't do any more sort of studying anymore. I really just wanted to earn money. I wanted to become really independent, do my own thing. So, so I took a break from st studying um, and I joined a company, uh, which is, I think it's still Aubrey from Rural at the moment, but it was initially part of Aventis and it was the um, diagnostic branch of the company. Uh, they were based in um, Glasgow at the time. Uh, I don't know anymore now, it was quite a few years ago. And I had a lovely time. I stayed there for about two and a half years. And after the two and a half years, it, I was fairly, fairly, fairly happy in, in the company. Um, it was um, you know, a nice working environment. But uh, what happened is, uh, you know, you have your professional life and you have a personal life as well. So, I met my husband there in Scotland and he's English, he's British, yeah. And um, uh, he was um, in the middle of, of uh, finding his way through academia as well. He had already completed his PhD at the time, so he's a little bit senior to me. And he wanted to gain some experience abroad and he started to look for positions outside Europe and was offered a post with, um, at the time, a big name in chemistry. So my husband's an organic chemist. And he moved to, well, we both moved. So he asked me to move him basically to Toronto. And once in Toronto, um, we had, it's, it's a lovely, I don't know if any of you guys is from, uh, from that area, but they are not, but uh, we had a really, it was a really nice, nice time that we had out there. Unfortunately, I was looking for a job and I was very stubborn, determined not to go back into academia or into any kind of studying. But after about half a year, even though um, our lifestyle was really good and everything, I, I was bored, basically. I, I couldn't find a job. <laughs> even though my social life was really good, I couldn't find a job. I was intellectually, I was really bored. Um, so my husband goes, well, you know, you, you have decent grades and you have a master's, so why don't you try to apply for a few PhD programs anyway and see what happens? So I sort of did and that never left academia since. Um, have tried many times <laughs> because you'll see I mean we'll go through this but academia has has its perks but it also has you know you you've got to be tough <laughs> so anyway we'll go through that a bit later um, but essentially we uh, landed in Toronto couldn't find a job so I said okay fine I'll go back to um, studying again so I entered a PhD program at the University of Guelph which is just outside Toronto and um, I worked with, my supervisor was from Japan and he was looking actually at the time for somebody coincidentally who could speak, even though we were in Canada, they should have been lots of people speaking both French and English. But because my PhD supervisor at the time was working very closely with uh, groups, research groups in France, he wanted somebody who could sort of uh, have that bilingual um, capacity, I guess. So it was, it was very, very fructuous. I, I learned a lot. Um, from him, from my uh, teammates, from my lab mate, mate, lab mate. It was, I, I, had a, I had a good time. It was tough, hard, long working hours, um, very few weekends. I was a tough time, but um, it definitely made me a different person. Definitely came out a different person at the end. In the meantime, uh, my husband was still very much into his sort of uh, research and wanted to make it as a um, principal investigator, as a PI, have his own research group. He was really determined to have his own research group. So he started to apply for 
uh, positions uh, where he would be become assistant professor to sort of then get onto the you know the academic career path. So he applied for a few positions um, in Canada as well as <laughs> sorry about that, as well as in the US. And um, next thing you know, he was like, okay, let's move to Texas. And just out of the brain, you know, when you're when you're in your twenties, like yeah, what the hell? You don't have any, you know, no attached, no commitment, nothing. You, you pretty much do whatever you want, which is which is a luxury, really, when you think about it. So he was offered that assistant professorship um, in uh, down in Arlington, in Texas, and I found myself again, you know, looking for a job. Um, but um, luckily, this time actually, I didn't have to look very. Very, very long at all. I think it might have been my second or third application. And um, the my PI, my supervisor at the time, had just started her group. It was very small group. In fact, it was just her a PhD student, a technician, and myself. So a very, very small group. And that was a little bit, um, it's different for me because in Guelph, my uh, supervisor was very well established already. Whereas in Texas, we saw I had to to set up the lab with my supervisor really. So we had to start everything from scratch and everything. Um, so it, it was it was a great learning experience as well. It was different. And I definitely learned a great deal. So even though I was only there for a year and a half, I thought I was <laughs> I thought I was having a hard time doing my PhD, but that's before <laughs> I met my supervisor in Texas. So it was a whole a whole new sort of learning experience, tough learning experience as well. But um, you know, you, you, you live, you learn, and it's great not having back. Obviously, I, it was really, I was sort of really torn at the time. And initially, when I just said, you know, I, I never left academia, even though I did try. Um, so I did try, actually, while I was in Texas to sort of look for positions. I've always been really looking for ways to kind of, it's always important. I think if there's one lesson that I can give you is, it's always good to have a plan B. I always think about what could be your safety net or sort of, um, you know, if you that career didn't work, what else would you do? Always be ready for that. So I stayed in Texas for a year and a half, and uh, that was around the time the recession hit. So when uh, 2008, when Obama was elected, the first time he was elected. Um, and what happened at the time as well is um, I got pregnant. So um, things started to be a little bit more difficult in terms of trying to be productive in the lab and being a uh, the a mom, well, at least what I thought was a good mom uh, to my little boy, and uh, things had to be a bit tougher. So I sort of slowed things down a bit, but my husband was still very sort of uh, determined to make it into uh, academia. And because recession hit, my husband had just been, he had just been there for less than two years, and they were laying off uh, young, the, the youngest recruits basically. Um, so my husband was given a year's notice, I 12 months to sort of start to look for another job. And after only about a month, he had already found another post. And we, because we had started a farm, well, you know, we had then a little baby, we said, it might be time to maybe move back home. So my family still lives in France and his family is in the UK. So we wanted to move back to Europe. Uh, it made sense for us because we were really struggling with childcare and it was, it was starting to be quite because maybe it was a bit younger, you know, you know, it's your first baby, there's a lot that's going on in your life. And I think we were quite happy to then be able to move back and be able to rely on our family a bit for help. So that's how we decided to move back. And it wasn't, again, it wasn't straightforward. We didn't move to either the UK or France, but we moved to Ireland, which is not that, not that far from, from either countries, really. So we moved to, to Dublin and Again, completely different culture, lovely culture, amazing. Um, you know, all the things that you hear about Irish people, how friendly they are and everything, that is completely true, completely true. Um, the country is, is true, it's never warm there, but it's, it, it's absolutely beautiful. So the last time was great. Then again, um, started to look for positions and somehow I sort of by default, I was always looking for academic positions because I had been in academia for a while. I had done my PhD and I had, so I'm postdoc in Texas and I at that time I think that's when I realized that I really enjoyed research I think that's sort of when I knew that this this was um you know so that that's what I needed intellectually so simulation that I needed so I stayed in Dublin for a little bit over two years and it was actually just for um, a, a one-year post at the time 
and my PI was was excellent. He's he's he was more like a friend than a supervisor or a boss, really. So it was great. Um, it was a large group. He was well established. I learned lots and lots as well. However, um, my PI, I guess maybe he was sort of going through a dip in his funding. So after about twelve months, he said, "Well, I can't really keep you that much longer. I probably have a couple of you know, um, I can probably." sustain your salary for a couple more months, but that's about it. So I started to look for a job probably before the end of the, the first year. And I was offered a post um, here in Liverpool and I've been here ever since. Uh, so it's been about eight years now. And um, coincidentally, so that brings me to, to the second lessons maybe that you can take out of the besides. So first lesson was always have a plan B. And second lesson is definitely cherish um, and sustain any sort of scholarly network that you can build either now at uni or in the future. Never, ever, ever neglect anybody that you can meet or can, you can chat to, um, especially if they are in the field or in, in an area that's of interest to you. So coincidentally, I, when I applied for the job, I didn't know, but I was, um, I was obviously, I needed reference letters. So I went to my boss in, uh, in Dublin and I told him his name is Ed. Ed, I'm, I'm applying at this post and this is this is my perspective, my potential new boss. And said, oh my gosh, I know him. Like they, they were pretty much best friends. And maybe that kind of impacted on why I was hired. But anyway, regardless, I'm still there. So I must somehow, I must be, I must be doing something right. Um, so anyway, um, they knew each other and actually I still work um, very closely with my boss in Dublin and he's doing so much better now in terms of funding his group is much larger he's twice the size in fact so he's doing very well and he in Liverpool my current land manager has been also um, so that's probably the lesson number three is that whoever you have as a supervisor or land manager you'll know straight away uh, whether first of all you get along and second of all you need somebody who's going to be supportive of you of you in terms of your research or professional ambitions, in terms of what you want to do with your career, you want you want mentors. So I was lucky enough to sort of have two mentors probably. So Ed and my current line manager, his name is Aras. So they were both very supportive of me, and um, especially um, uh, what happened. So <laughs> eight months after I joined Liverpool, actually eight, only eight months. Well, actually half a year after I joined, I. Um, I was pregnant again so my first boy was four year old at the time and then with my second baby I had a four year old and a little baby at home infant at home so then um, obviously I knew already all the hard work that was going to be with me trying to uh, have a full-time job in research and trying to uh, raise um, my two boys so my land manager was actually very supportive of me as well in terms of my time and um, you know, home working from home and stuff like that. So you need you need a lot to sort of you need support from work. You need. I also had a, a network of um, friends and family here who were very good with me with uh, nursery pickups and school runs and things like that. So um, that sort of really helped me with my career. And my boys are now much more independent, so they are um, age eleven and seven. Um, and they're much more independent. They, they sort of adapted to my lifestyle because they never really knew any, any difference. So they know that I work long hours. They know that at the weekend I might not always be home because I'm in the lab and stuff like that. But they've sort of, we've sort of adapted to each other. And I think it, it works out. It's not always perfect, like nothing is. But essentially, you kind of just have to deal with it. And the balance that I think... Um, Everybody is sort of looking for it's all different, different families, different people, different sort of balance. So I think that that gives you another view a little bit of uh, where I come from. Um, you'll see actually the, the only thing I haven't spoke, spoken about was in terms of my what I've been doing in terms of research. So initially, actually, I trained as a neuroscientist because I was always fascinated by um, everything brain related, sort of cognitive science and stuff like that. And I really enjoyed it. But what happened is during my bachelor's degree, I had a minor in immunology. And I just completely fell in love with immunology. And even though I was, at the time, I was offered uh, to go straight into a PhD program in neurosciences. So it was around that time already that I said, well, I'm really tired of studying. I already was sort of needed a break from academia, from studying, from uni, pretty much. 
Um, so around that time, I said, oh, I can't do neurosciences actually, even though I was still very passionate about it, I said, no, I, think, I don't think it's what I want to go into. But then immunology was there and it just had that really sort of, it was really, everything was sounded really real to me. I could, I could sort of see the relevance of it every day, you know, in terms of vaccinology, in terms of disease, in terms of, I just felt, felt that it was really a field that I could see myself in basically. So that's why I, I um, then I applied for a master's positions and I was taken in at the uh, Institute of Immunology in Marseille. So then immunology is sort of my thing and I've always wanted to work in vaccines, vaccine development. And even though I didn't go straight into it because I did my PhD on allergies actually, and then my postdoc in Texas was more on metabolic disorders and lipid inflammation. Um, I learned a lot, I, at least in Texas, that then I, learned, I did a bit of work on lactation. So then I knew, because as a mom, I think I, 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 it was even more relevant for me. So then I sort of thought, why don't I sort of try to marry those things that are of interest to me? So lactation and immunology. And uh, this sort of what I'm doing right now is that I'm able to, to merge these two fields right now and look at um, Maternal, maternal immunity and vaccinations and understanding how uh, the antibodies, for example, that's one of my research questions, are transferred uh, through the across the placenta from the mom to the babies, but also from the point of view of how disease can be transmitted from the mom to the babies. So I think that that's sort of, I don't know, maybe we could take a break from here and if anybody has any questions on sort of my um, academic um, training and career so far? Any questions? No? <laughs> I'm not hearing anything, so I just assume that there are no questions. So I'm just gonna, um, I wasn't really sure what to talk about really, but I just thought, because um, I'm a scientist essentially, um, uh, this is sort of my, I don't know how to say that, um, so an overview of my accomplishment, I'd say, or sort of what I think is needed. If let's say one of you guys wanted to get into research, um, these are sort of the exp expectations also that are, um, you know, that's what you ex you're expected to, to demonstrate as a researcher, you expect to demonstrate impact. So obviously publication is a big thing. Uh, you want to publish, but you don't just want to publish in any journals, you want to publish in the best journal possible. So there is a little bit of a competitive spirit in there. Um, but I think it can be in most places, I'd say it, it can be healthy, but it can also be quite, um, you know, you, you'll know straight away whether the, the environment is competitive negatively or positively for you. You and hopefully the uh, whatever, whatever institution you're going to work with organization you know you're going to be able to find that supportive environment so publication is a big thing in terms of accomplishment and it's always a great it's a great deal when you've worked for several years on a project um the reward is sort of a validation of your you know the quality of the research is really those research articles so it's all sort of personally very nice um but when you think about it i was having that i always have that chat with my friends who are not in academia it's nobody really cares really <laughs> it's merely you and obviously your colleagues and the, your other scientific peers um your peers and you know in group or even like in the wider global community in science but really in the big scheme of things it's you know, a paper is just like, it's just a bit like a certificate or a degree that you have and you kind of say, okay, it's nice to have it, but then you just, does, does that change really, does that really change your life? Not really, no, it's just sort of, a, for me anyway, just a sort of a personal uh, reward, really, personal satisfaction type of thing, but it's still, it's still quite nice. Um, now, in terms of output as well as a researcher, you also have to do a lot of teaching and I, I quite enjoy teaching. Most of my colleagues really kind of finding, um, I don't know, they, they, they don't really enjoy it, I think. They, find, they, they look at it as a chore rather than, um, you know, something that they should enjoy. So I, I do enjoy it quite a bit. It's, it's challenging and it's always a little bit sort of uh, mixed because you will, you will never enjoy every part of it and you will always come across situations where you will say oh well teaching is not really what I enjoy because of this or because of that or because of the environment or because of you know a variety of things 
but teaching is if you're into research and if you like teaching I mean you could be in a university that's really research intensive and you won't have to do much teaching but I think as a scientist as a researcher I think it's it's really almost a duty at least from my point of view to sort of you know share your knowledge share your experience and um and train the next generation I know it sounds very idealistic but for me that is true you you want to and also when you're passionate about something that's that I think the, the best way to sort of um sort of spread that passion and or inspire people that's for me that's that's really important it's like inspiring other people to to go into research in spite of all the <laughs> sacrifices that research and academia might encompass it's still teaching is also extremely rewarding for me anyway um now in terms as a researcher as well as i said earlier one of the key things not just as a researcher as a as a person i think and and if you want a profession a successful professional career whatever area that is whether it's fashion whether whatever it is you need you need to build your network uh, whoever you meet whoever you get along with hang on to those people uh, because they will allow you to get where you want um, and I think maybe something else that is expected, at least for me in my job description anyway, and again, I, I sort of enjoy it. It's not just all about publishing paper and, you know, designing projects and teaching and um, establishing a network with other scientists around the world. It's also self-participating to the um, life on campus, sort of. You're, you're a researcher, but you're not just there on your own as an you know, individual, you sort of interact with a whole lot of other people. So for example, something that I enjoy a lot, which is just right there, it says public engagement. I'm not sure what the term is in, in North America, but it's essentially as a researcher, we are sort of um, keen on sharing with, with um, lay people, you know, with, you know, it could be anybody, whether it's in schools or whether it's in museum, public places, we, I personally enjoy going out there and talk to them about what I do on a daily basis and how that is relevant to them and sort of try to explain things in a manner that will be uh, um, that they will understand basically. So that is another challenge actually, because it's very difficult to, you use a lot of very, very scientific language and try to explain that to um, people that are not scientists or little children and it's, I think it's it's a challenge, but it's great because if you can explain to a child what you do um, in your lab, in your lab, something that might be very complicated, then it means that you really have a full understanding of what you're doing. Um, so yeah, so what is expected of me really is to sort of participate to the uh, life on campus, the wider kind of activities, not just interface with the public, but also sort of within the organization. Um, I'm, chairing um, an association where uh, similar to what Anna is doing, I organize symposiums and meetings and invite speakers to again sort of really um, expand knowledge and expand, you know, promote interactions, communication. Uh, being a researcher and a scientist is, is about sharing, it's about discussing, it's about coming up with new ideas, it's about trying to create synergies. Um, so I think that's, that kind of covers this slide here. Any questions on this from anyone? <laughs> you're very quiet, guys. We're gonna have to. I'm gonna have to do like a, I don't know how many of you are here, but we're gonna have to go through everybody so I can so I know a little bit about everybody. So anyway, um, my just I'm not gonna. Yeah, maybe it's just another couple of slides, but I can tell you a bit more about my my work if you want to hear about it. But I'd like to hear a little bit from you though after this slide. These are just, I'm not gonna go through in detail. These are sort of, sort of um, tools that I use on a daily basis to, to design my research projects. So um, it's, there's so many, and science has evolved so rapidly. I mean, from the time, I mean, from the time I was, um, you know, an undergrad to now, I can definitely see a drastic difference. It, it evolves so rapidly. And that is challenging as well because you have to keep up with it. And especially in terms of genomics and all the omics tool over the past decade, it has completely changed the way you look at science, the way you design experiment, the way you think about a problem. Um, so it is a bit of a challenge, but what you do is, I'm not actually an expert in all these methods that are, that are listed on this slide, but, I, but that's what my collaborators are for. 
because I know I have a specific question, I will go to them. I say, look, I have this question. So what can I, you know, you're the expert in, let's say, I don't know, you're a genomist, you're, you're a bioinformatician. So tell me how, this is my answer. How can, this is my question. How can I answer it using comparative genomics? Or how can I, uh, so my expertise actually is more in the kind of lower, lower right quadrant where I'm more of an in vivo model, um, disease modeler where I, I sort of um, try to mimic, try to create models in vivo as well as in vitro. Um, this slide needs to be updated. Um, I started to work a lot on organ on the chips. I don't know if you've heard of those things, but essentially the creation of mini organs that you can grow in the lab. So these are the things that I work on. And having those models, uh, developing those models is, is a challenge. But once you have actually successfully developed those models, you can, the number of questions you can ask is almost sort of limitless, as long as you have the pair of hands, obviously, to do the work. So that's another challenge is you have all these ideas, but what you need to, and I haven't, I haven't, spoken, I haven't spoken about that yet, is you need to research to write papers, but to write papers, you need to do experimentation and to do experimentation, you need money. And to do the money, you need to write grant proposals. And that is another sort of, it's been a learning curve for me as well in terms of writing proposal and um, describing, um, articulating my research plan so that somebody else who would have never ever you know, met me or ever doesn't even know the project can understand. So that is another sort of skills that you, I don't know if one of you, some of you guys actually want to go into research, but research proposal is another skill. Writing them is another skill that you'll need to develop. And it's never too early to learn to write. So writing is definitely an essential skill. Um, and this is, yeah, this is just sort of what I was attached to the previous slides, really, that list of the, my, collab, my current collaborators, um, or past or present, some of them have sort of, um, you know, it's difficult to maintain relationship with people, but um, you sort of try to work on at it. And I think when it works out, you know, straight away, and it's sort of a very, you don't need to work at it too hard, but there are some obviously collaborations that are a little bit more difficult at, at sustaining. Um, but having collaborators opens up that sort of door to almost limitless um, you know, opportunities. And that's, that's sort of the idea. Um, and I think that's it really. Anna? <laughs> Can you hear me, Anna? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so if anyone has any other questions or, um, yeah, anything. We, so add. Anna, can you, can you tell me how many participants there are today? Um, there are 10 participants right now. Okay. So why don't we do a little bit of a round table? Would that be okay? Introduction. Yeah. So that I know if it's only 10, then I think it's, it's doable, isn't it? We can have everybody can just say a little bit about themselves and maybe um, sort of what their career ambitions might be if they already know or what they're what they're into right now is that all right and where they're from because I don't know it might be different countries or different states I don't know yeah that's is that all right everybody is everybody up for it <laughs> nobody's <laughs> do you want to start Anna maybe uh, sure. I don't know much about you either. So my name is Anna Grindolsky, and I'm a freshman at the Ohio State University, majoring in biochemistry, and I hope to become an anesthesiologist when I'm older. All right. Very good. What inspired you to sort of, you know, go? In, do you have any? Anybody in the family who's already a medical doctor or do you have anybody, a nurse or? Um, yeah, so my mom's an anesthesiologist and my dad is a nuclear engineer. So right. I kind of experienced both areas and I studied and built hydrogen reversible fuel cells with um, Dr. Yamashita. So yeah. yeah. Um, I really liked engineering, but I don't think I want to do it for my career. But as of right now, I really like anesthesia and shadowing my mom and her coworkers. Right. So 
that's what's drawn me to go to that path instead. All right, really good. Okay. Um, so, who wants to go next? <laughs> and I don't, Anna, you, you're leading this. If you are, I, I don't want to take over your, um, you sharing this. Um. Oh, you're all good. Um, I guess I can just call on someone. So, Romella, if you would like to go. <laughs> or if anyone just wants to go and introduce themselves. Hello. I can introduce. Me. Oh, sorry. Okay, sorry. There you go. <laughs> Okay, I'll go. Well, yeah. I'm Marion Bahabri. Um, I actually live in Charlotte, North Carolina right now. And so I'm a senior at UNCC, a biology major in a pre-med. My, my favorite, like my desire is like dermatologist kind of mostly or a plastic surgeon, but I'm not 100% sure. Like I'm still debating like whether or not. And so I've been since everything is like virtually I've been like trying to go outreach and just like watching these e-shadowing online and it's been really interesting yeah and I don't know do you guys want to know anything else um I guess you know my <laughs> my sort of question is um uh, because I'm a researcher so is that is that something that you see you know you want to be a dermatologist but do you see yourself as a as a consultant where you would or is it too early still? Is that something that you think you might like to work in the clinic as well as in the um, I don't I don't think so. I kind of mostly I've always on like one hands on mostly like surgeries, those mo mainly. Right. Yeah. All right. All right, who wants should I just call it I don't know the names that I can see. I can see Kristen. Is Kristen there? Yeah, I can introduce myself. Um, I am, I'm Kristen, uh, like Anna, I'm a freshman at The Ohio State University. Um, I'm studying molecular genetics and I'm actually, I think I want to eventually go into neurology, um, progress to graduate school, get involved in research. Um, so yeah. All right, really good. So can you be more specific into the, the research areas you'd like to be in too? Yeah, um, so I have always been very intrigued by our immune system and its role in disease and how ubiquitous it can seem. Just it has like, it has hands everywhere. So, um, and it's also a very, I feel like it's a very progressing field. Um, you know, like research is exploding, um, like T and B cells, I'm pretty sure if I'm not, if I'm wrong, maybe like two decades ago, people started to accept that they existed. So I'm interested in being the front, on the frontier of that. And yeah. Very good. So, so let tell me about Eva and now, Kristen, what, how much immunology do you have this year? How much, how many, do you have any lectures at all in immunology? Do you have anything at all? Or what, what's the curriculum like? Um, for me, I was planning on taking it senior year. Right now, I'm just taking general chemistry and bioethics. Right. Okay. Yeah, like Anna said, um, I'm pretty much doing prereqs right now. But um, if, if you have any literature you could recommend, because I'm looking for like books to start progressing my education in immunology before I get there in um, my later years. But yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. There are, there are textbooks that, are in, in fact, there's one. There's one that's called Janeway that is used across the globe. It's like um, it's like the Bible of, of immunology students, and you can start at any level. It's for you know anybody. A big, I would say, call it beginners. Like people who have ne don't have any basic knowledge of immunology at all can definitely easily read through that textbook. So I can send the detail to to Anna. She can forward to the group. Yeah, definitely. Hey, I just want to add something to, um, I, I just remembered, I'm actually taking immunology class right now. Oh, and yeah. I just, yeah, we just took an exam yesterday. Well, we, last thing, what we learned about was the MHC class one and class two. 
yes. and how the different they are and it's it's like really interesting i found it like about the mouse the different with the mouse and the human it's, it's a little yeah. bit hard because in my call in my college it's actually like a four thousand level so like super hard yeah and but it's it's really really interesting i kind of like enjoyed it so what was so what sort of textbook did you have and did you have a textbook um, actually, he's not really using, we have textbook, okay. but he's mostly like talking it out and like yeah. in lecture and he has like his own note, like PowerPoints. So what he records it. So what's the best thing for me that I noticed, like I learned, which is going back to his lectures, just listening to what he says and writing it down is really helpful. Yeah. So I don't mostly like use textbooks because also I'm like, I'm a visual learner. So like I have to, because also like I write the subtitle, I open the subtitles all the time. So I have to like read what read as he talks and then just like writing them down and then drawing the pictures yeah so yeah that's and i think it's the book the textbook that we're actually using i think i'm not sure the name but i think it's like the eighth edition he just added it so yeah some like, there's different people that actually read the textbook mm -hmm. yeah but it's really interesting yeah. anybody else wants to talk about themselves <laughs> I can go ahead. All right, go ahead, Mar Maritza. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my name is Maritza. I am from the Caribbean island of Puerto Rico. And I have two majors, one in psychology and the other one in microbiology. And my favorite classes so far were bi biochemistry and immunology. And right now I am applying to MD PhD. Oh, wow. Okay. So how, how does that work? Do you, since when you say you apply for MD PhDs, do you, do you choose programs? Like what, do you have a selection of um, different programs that you can choose from or how does that work? Well, I am right now living in California. So um, when I was an undergrad, I had um, three years of research experiences and I used to work in, physiology and biochemistry department. And I was um, working with G strains and um, mutations in my mitochondrial DNA. Right, very good. So, did, so you see, did you enjoy research? And that's why you, I guess- Yeah, that's yeah, I really enjoy it. Yeah. Very good, very good. But you don't want to. You don't want to leave the the states. You want to. You want to do it. You want to do it there. You don't want to sort of adventure. Well, right, right now, I am. I I want to stay local, right yeah. here in, in in California. Maybe some post doctoral um yes study. Good. I can go abroad. Mm -hmm. But yeah. right now, uh. COVID-19 situation, you don't really want to, you don't even want to plan to leave the country, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> right, thank you. Thank you very much for sharing. Thank you. All right. So anybody else who wants to talk who's here? <laughs> it's all right. Um, Again, if, if there's any sort of questions or if you, um, I think Anna, I don't know, Anna can forward you my um, contact details, feel free to contact me, uh, whatever it is, if you think I can help, or even if I can help, I can maybe direct you to somebody who can help. So don't hesitate to get in touch. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. Um, so if no one has any other questions or introductions, um, thank you for speaking today, Dr. Yang. And you're welcome. Yeah. And we'll be in touch. That's great. <laughs> All right.